Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you very much to the She Skeffington School for inviting me to talk about somebody who is a, a real heroine of mine. And it was great to see Michelin. Michelin is almost the identicate of her grandmother. So I think looking at her face and the strength of her face and the humour in her face is very much looking at Hannah as well. So that's the image I, I have in my head. So we know that Hannah G. Skeffington, one of the inspirations for the school, is one of the most notable women ever to have come out of Ireland, a feminist icon, an unrelenting fighter for causes that range from women's right to citizenship, Ireland's right to national freedom, everyone's right to religious freedom or the right to be atheist, women's right to control their fertility, support for Russian and Spanish revolutionaries, the list of her causes throughout her life is vast and I know that she would have made many connections with people in this room today. But the woman herself is more than just a life dedicated to endless causes. She was a profoundly human and humorous individual and she had to struggle to free herself from the influences of her upbringing. She was a woman widowed in the most brutal of circumstances but a woman who never lost the humanity that made her such an attractive individual. And that's, I think, why she is such an exemplary role model. At the age of 56, after her last prison term, which was one month, one month in Armagh jail for crossing the border to speak on behalf of Republican women prisoners, she was then defying a unionist imposed banning order. She wrote about her experience in Anfoblocht, if ever you're in jail, as well you may, reader of Anne Foblock, whatever else your jailers may take away from you, do not let them deprive you of your sense of humour. For you'll be sure to need it in jail more than anywhere else. I was always glad to have kept mine in Armagh, in Mountjoy, in Holloway, and in various Bridewell's barracks and police stations. I, I think it sums up a person. But she was an Irish woman born in 1877, when Queen Victoria was still on the throne. But her openness to new experiences, her acceptance of a diversity of views, her willingness to challenge orthodoxies is why she's inspirational. When she was in America in 1917, publicising the death of Frank and the cover-up of his murder, and also organising support for the ideals of the Easter Rising, a small group of American feminists were very quick to see that Hannah was really one of them and they invited her to become a member of what they called the heterodoxy. It was an extraordinary lunch club that met on Saturday afternoons for over 20 years. The members were feminists, socialists, peace advocates during the First World War, modern women with bobbed hair and unorthodox living arrangements. Some were openly lesbian, women like Crystal Eastman, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn. But the qualification for membership of the orthodoxy was the fact that the individual had in some way stepped outside of convention. They stood on street corners and handed out birth control literature. They helped organise strike committees. Sometimes they were arrested. A membership of the heterodoxy was always a proud boast of Hannah's. She loved to say she was a member of a club that only accepted the nonconformist. In her own family, she could trace a continuity between different generations who had struggled for freedom, just as Michelin continues um, that continuity. She could boast that her great-grandmother had known Lord Edward Fitzgerald, the United Irelands are killed in action in 1798. Hannah said that her grandmother was 106 when she died, so I actually touched the withered hand that had clasped his. Her father and uncle had both been Fenians, and her uncle Eugene was famous as the landlead priest. He once shared a platform with Anna Parnell and was always a strong supporter of the Ladies' Land League. As a young child, a chit of four, she called herself, Hannah visited her uncle when he was imprisoned in Kilmainham Jail. Twenty years later, Uncle Eugene hoped she'd write an account of the Ladies' Land League and the very early writings of Hannah when she was still a student, you can see that she always wanted the radical path and her emphasis was on women's readiness 
to take a militant path. Hannah and two of her sisters, encouraged by their mother, were among the tiny numbers of women to enter university. And it was then she realised that although women could do better than men in exams, and Hannah, in fact, did better than James Joyce, her contemporary, <laughs> but they couldn't vote, and therefore they were denied citizenship. And it was when being asked to sign a petition for the vote that was being circulated to women students in Britain and Ireland that she realised this. She said, I was amazed and disgusted to learn that I was classed among criminals, infants and lunatics. In fact, my status as a woman was worse than any of these. Naturally, I signed and became a conscious suffragist from that hour on. It was at university that she met Frank Skeffington and their marriage united their two surnames, symbolising a commitment to equality within the relationship. But a new life as an emancipated young woman didn't come that easily. Sexual love was a difficult area for young women of her background. In fact, before her marriage, she went to visit the nuns who had taught her and asked them for guidance, which I can't think of anyone <laughs> more unsuitable. But by the end of the first year as a married woman, she'd bought Mary Stopes' book, Married Love, a book considered immoral and obscene by most authorities, and of course by the Catholic Church, you probably still think that. Um, so a life determined by their own intellectual and moral convictions had started. And when their son Owen married in 1935, Andre, um, his wife, told me that one of Hannah's acts as a mother-in-law was to buy married love for the young couple. She said they shouldn't start a family too soon. But it was also partly a small act against censorship on Hannah's part, as the 1934 Criminal Law Amendment Act now banned the importation of contraceptives to the free state. She'd already dismissed those who had imposed the Censorship of Publications Act, which she said was a ridiculous law imposed by prudish men. So I like her blunt, straightforward way of speaking, and I think we can tell what her reactions would be to current issues here, such as abortion and marriage equality. Owen said his parents thought themselves out of religion, that they took a conscious moral decision to reject the tenets of Christianity, so he himself was not baptised. And this was really difficult and painful. There was estrangement from both side families. They spent a miserable Christmas on their own, the families not speaking to them. Hannah found that she could no longer work in a convent as a teacher. And we can see that she struggled with this for quite a while because when she went to jail in 1912, at her first imprisonment, she contemplated going to confession before embarking on a hunger strike. And she confessed this to Frank. And he smuggled in a furious letter to her. I don't see how you could ever have contemplated confession. Let them associate suffragism with atheism if they like. They'll be right. This is one of the things on which I am drastic and can't understand compromise. And so she never capitulated to religious convention again. When dying, she urged Owen to remember that she had no religion. I am an unrepentant pagan, she declared. <laughs> so I like to think of Hannah, a woman who loved flowers and gardens, who was aware of Ireland's Celtic past and tradition of strong women, defining herself as pagan. It seems to me to sum up a woman who rejected artificial man-made pomp and ceremony, the main function of which was simply to ensure the continued dominance of patriarchal authority. So how did her political activism begin? She and Frank had helped to set up the Irish Women's Franchise League as a militant campaigning group for women to get the vote. By 1912, desperate to ensure that women would be involved within the Home Rule Bill about to go through Parliament, one of their slogans was Home Rule for Irish Women as well as Irish Men, because women were going to be completely excluded from any kinds of political self-government. She and her colleagues felt they had no alternative now but to take the militant path. She chose the windows of Dublin Castle as her target because it was the seat of British rule in Ireland and she said she wanted to emphasise the wrongs of many years. So she clearly saw a connection between women's emancipation 
and national self-determination. The suffragettes saw themselves as outlaws as they had no say in the making of law. Hannah declared she wanted militant militancy. She said, desperate diseases need desperate remedies. And if the voters wrested from government by methods of terrorism, when five and 40 years of sweet and quiet reason produced only seven talked out or tricked out suffrage bills, why, who can say it wasn't worth a mutilated letter, a cut wire, a premier's racked nerves? By the outbreak of war two years later, she had become a gifted polemicist and an outspoken opponent of imperial rule. And she had a very powerful um, article in the Irish Citizen against the war. If male statesmanship, after all these centuries, has nothing better to offer by way of adjusting differences than a universal shambles, then in heaven's name, let men allow women to lend a hand not at mopping up the blood and purifying the stench of the abattoir, but at clearing away the whole rotten system. Until then, it's our duty to press on with unabated energy, to increase our activities at this crisis, to preach peace, sanity and suffrage. And I think it's really important at this time of centenaries what the emphasis on trench warfare and what men did in the war to see that there was a group of people who very, very uh, courageously continued to argue that war was not a way to solve political differences. You know that Frank's opposition to war led to imprisonment and a hunger and thirst strike before he won his release. The international suffrage movement was desperately trying to see what women could do to try and influence the male statesmen. And through Hannah's efforts, Irish women were going to be a separate delegation to the Women's International Peace Conference in The Hague, which took place in April 1915, exactly 100 years ago. She pressed for Ireland to be recognised as an independent, small nation, not part of a British section, which was always the case in the past. And it was an historic recognition. She said the first time on an international stage, Ireland was recognised as an independent, small nation. What happened was that the British government closed the North Sea to shipping and prevented both the British and the Irish women delegates from getting to The Hague. But itself, it set the foundations for what later became um, the League of Nations and it formed the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. So that Hague conference is something very important in the feminist calendar. In these tumultuous times just before the Easter Rising, Hannah was growing closer to the political views of James Connolly. She wrote to Louis Bennett, a, 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 milit a, a pacifist suffragist, um, on what her views were on the question of war. It's very significant because Hannah's often assumed to be a pacifist like her husband, but she said, if I saw a hope of Ireland being freed forever from British rule by a swift uprising, I would consider Irish men justified resorting to arms in order that we might be free. I should still be radically opposed to war and militarism. James Connolly told her that she had been nominated a member of a civil provisional government that would have come into existence if the rising had lasted for a longer period of time. And during those first couple of days, she brought food to some of the outposts and messages as well. But the murder of Frank, arrested while on his way home after unsuccessfully trying to organise a citizen's militia to prevent looting, and then brought to Portobello barracks, shot and buried in the barracks yard, his family not informed of his death, completed Hannah's alienation from the British state and prompted her growing commitment to republican ideals. In publicising his murder, she found her home ransacked by soldiers, her son terrified, his drawings confiscated as evidence of pro-German sympathies, her maid arrested, Frank buried secretly without her knowledge. By force of will and using all the contacts she and Frank had built up over years of political activity, she managed to meet Prime Minister Asquith and made the British government agree to a public inquiry. I often think of um, 
the widow of Pat Fanouk, and when I think of what, what Hannah had to do that at that time, and how she succeeded in getting an inquiry, whereas Geraldine Fanouk is still mobilising and lobbying in America to try and, and get the same. But despite her efforts, the public inquiry and the public inquiry, there was a cover-up by military and politicians, and Bowen Colthurst, the perpetrator, was able to settle down in Canada, while Sir Francis Vane, the officer who had done so much to help Anna in, Hannah in her efforts, was dismissed from the army. She refused very substantial compensation by the British states, money that she could have done with. She had very, very little now. But she decided to publicise Frank's murder in America. <coughs> she was now hounded by the British state, refused a passport to travel, and had to smuggle over herself and Owen using assumed identities. While in America, she was tailed by Secret Service agents who reported on her meetings and on what she said. But she managed to have an interview with President Wilson. And by the time she was ready to return home to Ireland in July 1918, she described herself as a Sinn Féiner, ready to take her part in the new national movement. She said that the Easter Rising was the first time in history that men fighting for freedom voluntarily included women, and that this was one of the defining moments in terms of women's emancipation on an international stage. The Russian Revolution came later, the American War of Independence was not about women, and the French Revolution was about the rights of men despite women in France themselves trying to fight for citizenship. So we need to remember that when we think about the significance of the Easter Proclamation and the ideals of the Rising. After docking at Liverpool, Hannah discovered that permission for her to continue on to Ireland was refused. She went to London, she petitioned politicians, she exhausted her patience and smuggled herself <coughs> home, dressed in overalls, hiding in a ship's hold. But not long after she arrived home, she was arrested as an illegal immigrant and sent back to England, to Holloway Jail, to join Ward Gone and Kathleen Clark. But she immediately, as an experienced suffragette, went on hunger strike and was seen back in Ireland, now a leading member of Sinn Féin and their director of organisation. She also wanted to stand for the Doyle in the very first elections in 1918, when women over 30 had the right to vote, but she was offered a seat that she was told un was unwinnable, so she decided not to, she rejected it. In the years that she was involved with Sinn Féin, it's possible to trace her influence. It's as tangible, I think, and unique as a fingerprint left on documents. For example, this is one of the instructions. An impression exists in some districts that membership of Cumberland is confined to men. This is a mistake. And every effort should be made to ensure that women shall not only be on the role of members, but take an active share in the work of Cumberland and Sinn Féin generally. And I'm sure that quotas for women in political parties would have received her full support. She opposed the treaty and campaigned hard for women over 21 to have the vote so that they would be able to vote on the issue. She wrote to an old friend saying, the fight for this absorbed all my energies and it seemed like old suffragette times again. When, as I said earlier, in 1933, the Northern authorities arrested her for speaking at a meeting in Newry, she made a defiant speech from the dock. She said, I recognise no partition. I recognise that it is not a crime to be in my own country. I would be ashamed of my race. I would be ashamed of my murdered husband if I admitted that I was an alien in Armagh, Down, Derry, or any of the 32 counties. And when she was released from prison, thousands came to meet her in Dundalk, Drogheda and Dublin as she made a triumphal motorcade tour on her as down through the east coast of Ireland. In later years, she said, one need not become elderly minded and she hoped she never would. And she never did. In 1943, at the age of 66, she stood for the Doyle one of four independents who hoped their example would lead to the formation of a women's party. Her election manifesto was a declaration of the principles by which she'd lived her life. 
She said there can be no true democracy where there is not complete economic and political freedom for the entire nation, both men and women. How can there be effective administration when the political machine is entirely controlled by one sex only? Nationally, I stand for the complete independence of Ireland and for the abolition of partition. Under the 1916 proclamation, Irish women were given equal citizenship, equal rights and equal opportunities. And subsequent constitutions have filched these or smothered them in mere empty formula. The very last article she wrote was published after her death. While it was written in support of her daughter-in-law, Andre, who was a co-founder of the Irish Housewives League, Hannah made it plain how much she disliked the word housewife. These clumsy, man-made words remind us how little free we really are. So housewife is accepted more or less meekly by most women, as we accept men's names in marriage and live in their inconveniently constructed houses. <laughs> For me, it's impossible not to love and admire somebody with that outspoken spirit. To Hannah Shee Skeffington, a woman whose political and personal life still has resonance and relevance, a woman for our times. Thank you.